All right, hi everyone. This is going to be the lecture for chapters four and four S. So I do have the full PowerPoint of both of these chapters available on Blackboard. Chapter four, I've really cut down to about um, 10 or 11 slides, I think it is, uh, because our main focus in this class is going to be on chapter four S. Uh, in terms of the quantitative elements all come from that chapter, uh, which is about productivity. The S chapters are supplementary chapters with additional knowledge. You'll see in chapter five, which is coming up, that we have a big focus on chapter five S as well. Um, chapter four has to do with designing your product or service that your company or organization um, provides for people um, and some some of the key elements in the design phase. Um, there are some, you know, true, false, multiple choice uh, type questions on your quiz that will come from chapter four as well as 4S. But uh, like I said, all the quantitative work and the separate video on how to do the practice problems will all come from chapter 4S. So chapter four, product and service design, you know, we've talked about how um, what an organization is all about is the goods and services that, is, that it offers. That's the operations uh, team is, is producing that good or providing that service. And really all the other um, departments and services are uh, structured around that, um, that part of the organization. Um, you know, everything is there to support uh, what your uh, organization exists to do. So um, the design of that product um, should be very closely tied to what your strategy is as a company. What's your overall strategy in terms of um, your long-term plans and goals uh, for your company? And um, you know, creating a product or providing a service without taking a lot of consideration in the design phase is one way to um, fail as a company. So some of the questions you should ask yourself, we've got two on this slide, two on the next slide, but uh, the first one is, is there a demand for this? Is there actually a market? If so, what's the size of that market? What does that customer look like, all right? Can we do it? Do we actually have the manufacturing capability to produce that and produce it at uh, acceptable profit margins? Maybe we could make it, maybe we have to buy new equipment, but when you do the cost analysis, the, um, the pearl isn't worth the dive, so to speak. So serviceability is, you know, um, can you provide that service, right? So manufacturability, serviceability, both are capabilities of being able to produce that good or perform that service. So is there demand for it? Can we do it? Uh, what level of quality is appropriate? So if we're going to enter this um, market, if we're going to make this good, what level of quality do we need to uh, obtain in order to um, do right, to actually succeed at it? Um, you have to look at what your competitor is offering. Um, is it a fit for the products you normally offer? If you're offering a luxury good in this in this new um, uh you know, product market and it doesn't match your other offerings, it doesn't probably make sense for sticking to what you know how to do, right? Um, unless it's something that you really want to change gears and have a big focus on. And then does it make sense from an economic standpoint? There are so many issues and costs to take into considerations that at the end of the day, will you, are you more likely than not to clear profit? And if you're more likely than not by what, you know, uh, what, what is that likelihood? If, it, if it's a slim chance, uh, but you know, 51% to 49% chance of making a profit, probably not, um, probably not the best route to go on. Um, but when you do the deep analysis, does it still make sense to proceed? Now, once you have um, made that decision, you need to uh, either design the product or service or redesign it. Sometimes, you know, you might relaunch a product altogether. Sometimes it's it's time for an update. You know, vehicles, um, you know, they they keep with one design for a few for a few years of that model and then they update it. Uh, often that's to keep up with competitors. Often it's um, new technologies. 
a number of reasons why you might do a full redesign of a of a car model or or you know how often does the iphone get redesigned they, they seem to stick with the same general body design for a while um you know the 10 uh 10s um, 11 stuck with the same body design i think the 12 did too and then eventually they went back to the the squared off or the the flat edges um that they used way back on the four um it was a popular design but they made it uh, they made it work again um changing times and and views um looking at your competitors um looking at the cost for that looking at what technology is available to do a redesign. So maybe you had an idea of something you wanted to make a long time ago, and now the technology is there where you can actually make it. Um, some considerations include legal considerations. So, um, you know, making sure that your design includes uh, enough safety features or um, has been well designed enough to not cause liabilities um, that could lead to legal costs or uh, damage to your reputation. Um, is it something we could make? Yeah, but we're not really, you know, we don't have the right equipment for that. So I don't know that we could make it up to what our, you know, level of competition is or what, what would be deemed, um, you know, uh, acceptable by the public. Uh, ethical considerations. Sometimes when you're in the design phase, you're under pressure to meet deadlines and you might speed up the design process and that might include cutting costs or shipping a product that is full of bugs um you know if you uh play video games you might know that uh, often nowadays games are shipped with the idea that they need a day one update they ship them before they're really actually ready and then they send out several updates to hopefully fix it. And sometimes that risks damage to your reputation. Um, a few big profile games had that had that occur uh, recently. I don't want to out myself as too much of a nerd, but there was a Fallout game and a Cyberpunk game where met those kind of, uh, uh, you know, release it, risk some damage to your reputation types of uh, types of issues. Um, or do you work out the bugs ahead of time and forego that revenue you could have been you know, raking in for a few months before you actually fixed it. You know, when the when video games were in cartridges, you didn't get to update them over the air. They they had to be shipped ready, or you know, you would never be able to sell anymore if people discovered uh, uh, bugs that just wouldn't work. All right, other considerations, you know, safety issues, cultural factors could be preferences from different countries or regions. Certain colors are acceptable. Um, if you make food, what, you know, what's the preferred food type? Are, are you going to expand, you know, uh, a coffee shop like Starbucks into some countries where tea is predominant and coffee's not, you know, drank uh, heavily as the hot beverage of choice? Um, what, what do you, how are you going to design your product labels? It, you know, making sure that you're not going to accidentally um, uh, put something out there that's offensive to, um, you know, a, 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 the people of another country or region. Um, and then, you know, are, do you then bring in experts? Do you do your research or do you have the design teams all over the world in those countries to, to really be on the ground and have a, have a deep understanding of that? So those are some, some considerations. Uh, consider whether or not you can be sustainable. So do you can you use those resources in your design so that it doesn't harm systems that support human existence? That would be really nice if uh, companies would make that a, a focus. Um, some of the key aspects for sustainability, cradle to grave assessment. This is the entire life cycle of the product from the design all the way to, um, you know, the uh, stop, the, stopping to produce it anymore. Um, how are you going to stop that uh, support for that product uh, down the road? Um, you know, are you going to stop updating it if it's, if it's software of some kind or, you know, like uh, uh, Windows, uh, Windows operating system? You know, for a certain amount of time, one type of Windows right now, you know, um, Windows 10. In the past, you've got popular uh, versions of Windows like Windows 7, and then eventually they stop putting out um, new uh, security updates for it because so many people have adopted the, the newer versions of it. Windows XP was very popular, and people held on to XP and Windows 7 for a long time, completely ignoring Windows 8 or some other options for businesses. And then uh, the three R's um, is, is key to sustainability. Reduce the amount of materials needed. 
especially packaging materials, it's getting pretty ridiculous. You know, Costco, uh, for all the good they do in general as a company, um, they want to have a big shelf presence. So you might, I bought a SD card um, there. So the thing's, you know, yay big, but it came in a, a, a packaging that hang up, hung up on the wall, you know, uh, probably a foot tall, and, you know, eight inches wide, you know, for this little tiny SD card. Uh, can can the items be recycled? Uh, you know, uh, plastics uh, aren't recyclable. Um, some estimates might say that zero percent of plastics ha have been ever recycled. Uh, most estimates say around five percent only gets recycled. So, yes, good on you for doing your part of throwing that in the recycling bin. But uh, just know that those single use plastics really are single use, and it's kind of uh, not actually being uh, uh, recycled in any way. It uh, um, you know, very small percentages. Um, cradle to grave assessment. Um, so you know, assessing the environment, environmental impact of a product through, through its useful life. Um, global warming, smog formation, oxygen depletion, solid waste generation. Are you going to have a product that put, puts out so much um, waste that it could uh, uh, interfere with um, you know water supplies? There, is, there are three main um, uh, ISO, ISO uh, codes. One of them, the 14,000 um, group of those has to do with environmental um, sustainability and environmental management. You'll see uh, a few other ones later on in the book. Um, st uh, like standardization is one of them, uh, ISO 9000, I believe. Could be wrong with that number. Uh, product and service life stages. So this is the general uh, flow. You introduce a product, it steadily uh, over time will grow until it reaches maturity. And then that, that tends to level off. It, it, it grows a lot, a lot slower and then eventually starts to decline in popularity. Um, unless you're the TI-84 calculator, then you just stay at maturity level for the rest of, uh, till the heat death of the universe, I think, because that thing hasn't changed in 30 years and still cost a hundred bucks. So. Uh, you know, that's the one product I can say it probably is never going to go away for some reason. Um, mostly joking. Uh, standardization. This is to the, ex the extent to which you can um, have certain uh, key items so that you can um, uh, use certain parts in other uh, processes or the design of other products. Um, you might be able to order, you know, this product in bulk. Uh, maybe you just, you have seven different models of iPhone, but they all use the same uh, chip inside of them, even though the screen sizes are different, at least some of them is, is standardized, right? What's the advantage of standardization? Fewer parts to deal with, if, um, reduced costs, reduced training, um, you, you know, uh, you can fill those orders a lot easier because you only have one item in inventory to stock instead of three different size screws for four different, products or something like that. Um, you can make longer production runs because that part of the design uh, or the production can be, uh, is the same for all the uh, products within that line. Um, designs may be frozen too early. So you might be at a point where you can't update certain models within a line because it needs that standard equipment that comes with all of them. Uh, you know, phone ports was one of those one of those things. You had the Pro version of phones, but um, whereas the I iPad Pro eventually started using the um, the uh, USB C size uh, port um, that the rest of the world uses. Um, you know, uh, Apple's held onto that Lightning uh, port for for a while now. Um, high cost of design changes, decreased product variety. Yeah, if too many parts are standardized, you can't have a lot of variety there um, because you rely on some, so many of them to be the same. All right, now let's look at the, the, uh, the reliability chapter, supplementary chapter four. So this chapter, three main objectives, defining reliability, performing simple reliability computations, and then explaining what availability means and performing those simple calculations. So. Uh, reliability is just can the product work as intended, right? Simple as that. I mean, it's a little bit longer of a definition in case you get this on a multiple choice question, but uh, the, the ability for it to work, to do what it's intended to do, um, that can be expressed as a probability, a likelihood that it will work. That's the reliability uh, factor. 
uh, often it's expressed as a decimal uh, place. So, you know, 99% reliability would be expressed as 0.99. Um, you know, you could express it as a percentage or say it as a percentage as well, which really up to preference on that. If we want to quantify it, we assign a probability to it. Um, the probability that it will function when activated and then the probability that it will last for at least a certain amount of time. Those are two different uh, reliability measures we're going to be looking at. So again, that was, will it work when you attempt to, to, to use it? And what's the likelihood, the probability that, you know, let's say that on average, the product lasts 24 months. How, what's the likelihood that that will last for 36 months, right? We can, we can factor that out. Um, the reliability when activated um, assumes that there are a number of independent components of a system and that the probabilities uh, are known for each of those independent events. And um, it's an independent event if one thing does not directly influence the other. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's, let's look at that some more and we'll look at an example, including some math there. So if two or more events are independent and whether or not that event succeeds is, uh, uh, is defined as the probability of all those events occurring, then the probability of success is equal to the product or the probabilities of the events. Uh, it sounds very mathy, so stick with me here. But let's say that, um, you know, uh, a, a pro for me to turn a vehicle on, I have to be able to have the... Um, you know, the, the gas reached the combustion chamber of the engine. I don't really uh, um, have too fine details on how a car actually works, I'm realizing. And you have to have the starter both, uh, you know, uh, have the spark to, to fire up the combustion. And the, oh man, we've got to get torn apart from my explanation of how a car starts. But anyway, let's say there's two different things. They both have to happen in order for you to start your vehicle, right? So the probability that your, that your car starts is the probability of, of your ignition starting and uh, you know the gas getting through the uh, into the combustion uh, chamber, which was a carburetor in older vehicles, I don't, I, you know, fuel injection systems on newer cars. But let's say it's two different things. Your probability of it actually happening is the probability of this times the probability of this. Both of them have to occur for you to succeed in starting your vehicle. So probability of the ignition plus or times the probability of this, multiply them together, that's your overall probability uh, as a mathematical factor. So let's say that a machine, here we go, uh, bail me out slides. A machine has two buttons. So in order for the machine to work, both buttons have to work. If, if, if the probability of this button working is 95% of the probability of this button working is 88%, then the probability of the machine working is 95% times 88%, so 0.95 times 0.88, and 83.6% is the chance that the machine works. They both have to work, or you would say the machine doesn't work any time. So reliability when activated, the, um, they, uh, they might have several components that each have a relatively high reliability, right? 90% chance, 90% chance, 90% chance, okay? Pretty reliable. But because all of those things have to occur in order for it to be successful, that percentage times percentage times percentage keeps getting multiplied as lower and lower. You know, 90% chance, 90% chance, both are very good. You multiply that together, you only have an 81% chance. You multiply that again, you have a 72 point something percent chance, right? So it keeps going down as more, as more individual uh, components are introduced. You can reduce that, um, uh, um, you can reduce that uh, deficit, or rather you can enhance the reliability by using redundancy. Redundancy is a backup for any, any one of those individual components. So if I've got button here and button here, and each one of them has a backup button, then my overall reliability goes up. So redundancy is the use of backup components to increase your reliability. So if those independent events uh, um, are defined as probably at least one occurring, the probability of success is equal to the probability of either one plus one minus the probability multiplied by the other probability. What? Okay, so here is the reliability of backups. So a restaurant located here has power outages and uses a, a generator 
to run its refrigeration equipment in case of the main system uh, having a power failure. So the local power company operates 97% chance that it'll operate at any given point. But the backup, right, the redundancy for power is this generator. And what the whole one minus thing means is, I'm going to draw on the screen for a second here. Let's go to draw. So um, I think that we can do right here. Yeah. So the, I'm going to look over my other screen where I've got the PowerPoint up. Um, you've got power being delivered at 97% rate. Pretty good. If that power does fail, though, you've got a generator that works 90% of the time. So not as reliable by itself, but it's just there for redundancy. It's there as a backup, right? So you have a 97% chance of success. That's what's written here. And then you have a chance for the generator to be needed. The generator is not always needed. So how many times, if it works 97% of the time, how many times does a power company fail? What fails the difference between one and the probability that it, that it works, right? So that's what the one minus means. So one minus 97% is 0.03, okay? That means there's a 3% chance that you actually need the generator. So 97% of the time, you don't need the generator, meaning 3% of the time you do. So you get to add to your, to your initial reliability, 3% of the generator's reliability, because that's the amount of time you'll actually need the generator. So 3% times 0.9% is 0 0.027. So this right here, you get 97% chance the power company works. Then if it doesn't work, that 3% of the time, you get a 90%. That equates to 0 0.027, 2.7% of the time. You get that as well. You get to add those together, the 97% and the 2.7%, you get 0.997, which is a 99.7% uh, prob probability of success. Nearly 100, pretty good, better than 97%. So you've increased the reliability, you've increased the chance that it's going to work um, by adding that redundancy. All right, the last thing we have here, if two or more events are involved, um, you've got a definition here. Let me break it down for you. What this means is that you just keep doing the one minus every time if you have two backups. So you can pause that and read what that says, but let me let me show you on this next slide here. All right. What's happening here is you've got 85% chance that your calculator works, but you're taking the exam and you're so paranoid that your calculator is not gonna work on your exam because it's, uh, say it's solar powered. Did you know that most of those Casio solar powered things were never really solar powered? If you pop them open, they had batteries inside them the whole time. <laughs> Everything you know is a lie. Um, so you've got 85% chance that the calculator works. But you really need this calculator because uh, uh, your professor didn't do like I do and enabled the one on the lockdown browser for you. Um, so you need this calculator here. 85% chance it works. And then that means 15% of the time that calculator is not going to work. So that means you get to add a um, uh, an additional uh, one minus this. So 85% of the time it works. One minus 85%, it doesn't work. So one minus 0.85, right? One minus 85 is 0.15. I'm gonna write that over here. So we can take this initial probability, we get to add this to it, okay? So we get to add uh, 0.15 times uh, 0.8, which is uh, what, 1.2, I think, I think. Well, 1.2%, which is 0.12%. No, point. We get to add uh, 12%. So 0 0.12, yeah. We get to add that to it, all right? And then after that, we have uh, a chance for this to fail, which is a 20% chance that, uh, that this one fails. So if this one fails, we get to add to that a uh, chance that um, we get to use this other calculator as well. So to that one, we get a, um, let's see here, chance of this failing is 0 0.2, make sure I'm doing this right. 
No, because we get how much here? I've lost it. I'll show you this in in in, uh, in much more detail on the Excel file and the practice problems. Uh, we get um, how often does this one get used then? 0 0.2 times that 0.1 point. Five. That's not quite, is it? Is it point two times that? I've lost it. And I'm so far into this video too, but I'm not going to re record it. Um, anywho, I, I'll show you that on the, on the step by step breakdown, but you can do it a simpler way, which is, uh, which is this formula. I was trying to work it out line by line. I'll do it on the Excel file because I don't have my calculator handy. You know, see, it'd be nice if I did. Um, and what you can do is you can do one minus this times one minus this times one minus this, and then one minus that, all of that in the bracket. So one minus that is 0.15, one minus that is 0.2, and one minus that is 0.25. So you can take one minus all three of these, multiply them together, and you end up with, let's see, I believe I can get a calculator over there. There we are. I think I hope you, you can see that calculator. Um, but you end up with 0.15 times 0.2 times 0.25, and you get it's a very small number, 0 0.0075. So basically, this probability is a chance of total failure, all three of them failing. Very slim likelihood that all three will fail. Instead, if that's the chance that it'll fail, we can take the inverse of this to see the, the, uh, the probability of success, which is one minus 0 0.0075, 99.25% 99 chance of success. So each one of these had a very poor um, chance of uh, succeeding on its own, really. I mean, 85% is not that great. It's okay, right? But because of all the redundancy, you have a 99.25% chance of having a working calculator. So that's pretty good odds. All right, so that's the easier way of doing it. I was trying to show you the long way where you went step by step, but I, I'll show you that in detail on the Excel video where I've, where I've got the math right of it. Sorry about that, folks. All right, let's clear off those drawings. And on to the next one. Here we go. What's this system's reliability? So in this, in this situation, we have um, three individual components here. Okay, we've got um, component one, component two, component three. Each one of these individually has to um, uh, work for it to be a success. So what's the chance that this works? It has a redundancy in it. What's the chance that this works? It has a redundancy in it. What's the chance that this works? It has a redundancy in it. Well, fortunately, we just did 85, 80, 75, which is 85, 80, 75. And we know that uh, because we just did the math of it, that this one right here has a 0.9925. So that one's easy because we, we already did this one, right? This one, you've got a, a redundancy of, um, here we go. You've got a 95% chance of it working. And then the 5% of the time, one minus 95%, you have an 80% chance of succeeding. So um, one, one minus 0.95 is 0.05 times 0.8 you get to add this to 95%. So plus 95, you have a 99% chance of this one working. So I'm gonna draw 99% on there, 0.99, all right. And then from here, you've got 0 0.9, 0 0.7. So what are the chances that this one works? You've got one minus 0 0.9 times, so 10% of the time you need a backup, Multiply that by your probability of your backup, which is seven. Uh, oops. Yeah, one minus 0 0.9, 0 0.1 times 0 0.7, 0 0.07. So you get to add 7% onto your reliability and add that back to the initial 90, you get 0 0.97. All right. So each of these has backups. The initial reliability gets improved in all cases. And the last step is that you need to um, multiply them across. So you add your new, your new likelihood, your new reliability of each component together, 
0.99 times 0.9925 times 0.97. So overall, the system has a 95.31% chance of, uh, of, of working at any given point. So let me clear those drawings off again. 95.31. There we go. So this component had 99. This component had 99.25. This one had 97. Multiply across, you get 0 0.9531. Reliability over time uh, resembles a bathtub. What does that mean? Well, you're going to see on the next slide. Um, the reliabilities often uh, ha have a high likelihood of failure when you initially introduce a uh, product. And then over time, fewer random failures, and then eventually it starts failing again due to being worn out. Um, so your reliabilities are relative to a specified length of time, meaning you have a warranty established and then the reliability is compared to that amount of time, what's likely that it lasts for two years, three years, six months, whatever it is. So you can see here, you've got failure rate initially, like a lot of failure because it's not designed well, um, some inadequacies, your staff isn't fully trained on making it. So you have a lot of uh, defects and failures initially. Then over time, you've kind of stabled out how to make it, you're, you're, you're flowing well, and very few random failures around the field. If it makes it this far, it's likely to make it the intended length. And then eventually the product just wears out and it starts to fail a lot more again. So bathtub curve, they call that, where it starts off one way and then goes up. Um, if you want to identify the length of time to um, uh, between failures, uh, we can we can use a chart called uh, the mean time before failures. Uh, there's, it follows an exponential distribution. We're not going to do a lot of the big math on this one. You're going to get to use the uh, chart from your books that has a table you'll just look at to find these reliability numbers, fortunately. Um, and so there is a... Um, time at which it's likely to fail. And so your reliability is uh, can be viewed as the number from this chart that you'll I'll, I'll show you how to look up. And then your likelihood of failing before that point is the inverse of that. So if there's a um, you know 60% 60, 60 chance that, it, that the failure point will be after this, well, then your reliability here is one minus that. So 60% chance that it's this way, that leaves 40% chance that it's this way. That's the general idea there. So um, you have here, uh, again, a long exponential distribution formula. Don't worry, don't sweat this math too much, but the idea here is that you take um, the length of service before failures and then you divide. So let's say we wanted to know what's the likelihood that something makes it 20 months. We would take 20 months and then divide it by the mean time, the average time between failures. Well, how? If we did a lot of testing of it, what was the average time of all those tests on which it did fail? That's going to give us a number on a chart. We look up that number. Uh, let's say it's 1.2. We look up 1.2 in our chart in our book, and it gives us a percentage. Simple as that. Um, so, for example, uh, let's say that there's a light bulb manufacturer, and the mean time, the average time between failures was 2,000. So what's the probability that it actually will fail before 2000. So what we do is we divide the 2000 by 2000, the, the, the length of time we're checking for, and we divide that by the, the mean time between failures, which was 2000. So what's the likelihood that it will fail before that point? Well, 2000 divided by 2000 is one, but it's not one. We go into table 4S1 in our book, uh, in chapter 4S, there's a table, you look up the value 1.0 on that table, and that value tells us it's uh, 0.3679. That's the given value uh, there, which means there's a 36.79% chance it'll actually fail after the 2000 hour mark. So what's the chance it'll fail before 2000 hours? We just take one minus that number. The probability it'll fail before that mark is one minus. So everything on this side of that line is 36.79%. Everything before it is one minus 36.79%. So again, you're gonna, I'll, I'll show you this and I'll show you what that chart looks like in the additional video where we go over the, um, the math practice problems. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, let's not, let's just skip that. Okay, your availability. Your availability is your, um, the, the mean time between failures of, of an item. How often in months does it typically last? And you divide that by the mean time between failures plus how long does it take to repair it if it does go out? So what, is that, what would that look like? So let's say that the student um, uses his uh, uh, laptop for 30 weeks before it fails for whatever reason. It's not nothing very good. And then if it does fail, uh, you, you send it off for repair. It takes a week and a half to get, to get it back from the repair. So how often is it actually available? What percentage of the time is it actually available? So it fails every 30 weeks, okay? So 30 weeks here divided by 30 plus the amount of time it takes to repair it, week and a half. 30 divided by 30, 1.5 is availability of 95.24% of the time, all right? This number is always going to be less than 100. You cannot be available more than 100% of the time. If you do a problem on this one and it, it comes out to above 100%, you've done something wrong. You've done these out of order or something. So uh, I've had some uh, problems get turned in the past that were above 100%. You can't be available more than all the time. All right, that's it for this. Um, I gave you some of the math in advance, um, but we'll look at the practice problems from Chapter 4S on the additional video. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.